Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Andre Falco. Today, I have the, rep the pleasure of representing Lyft. I've been at Lyft for three months. Prior to Lyft, I was at Salesforce. The reason I'm representing Lyft today is because the journey that I took to automate security updates at Salesforce, we followed the same strategy in both places. In this talk, I'm going to first talk through what the problem is and why we need to automate. Then I go through a solution that you can all apply in your day-to-day -day lives. I have a live demo of some tooling in action. And then I talk about some challenges that you have to think about when applying these tools. And finally, I'll conclude with takeaways. In the pre-Docker days, we essentially ran our infrastructures by having cron jobs that would do OS updates. What was nice about that was as soon as a distribution would publish a package, that it would get pulled down by your cron job at whatever cadence you choose. With Docker, we went from that to these immutable objects that you have to build in advance and then ship. So if you don't do that, then you don't get those packages that the distributions publish. What makes it even more challenging is that when, whenever there's a vulnerability to one of the packages and the distribution publishes a fix or a fixed package, you don't know which image to rebuild. If it's the Java, if it's a Java package, then you, you have to rebuild the Java base image. But there's no easy way to detect which packages get installed on which of your Docker images. The order in which you rebuild your images also matters. If, for example, there's a vulnerability in the base OS image, and you try to rebuild your application image, that won't work. You have to first rebuild the base OS image, then your Java base image in this example, and then a rebuild of the application will pull down that vulnerability, or, or that package that has a vulnerability fix. If you have a larger, larger organization, you might have a large tree of images. Perhaps it's in the, thousand, in the thousands or hundreds. But if you do this rebuild order manually, it's very likely you won't do it at all. It's pretty easy to rebuild your, your, your Docker image, but remembering to do it is, is tough. Once a, once a package has a vulnerability that's known in the wild, we're all in a race against time to get that fix into our production systems, to get all of our Docker images updated and then get them deployed. The longer we take, the longer we're vulnerable. If we naively say, well, why don't we just rebuild every single image that we have continuously? Eventually, all the vulnerabilities will be fixed. We'll rebuild everything in the right order eventually. But then we won't be able to take advantage of modern cloud environments where you have elastic scale. At Lyft, we run our infrastructure for CI in an auto-scale way. When our, developer, when, I, when our developers are at work, we scale up. When developers are asleep, we scale down. So the continuous rebuild would incur extra cost on us. So what can we do? If you're familiar with test and release pipelines, or if you're not familiar with test and release pipelines, they are automated pipelines that respond to code changes in Git or your version control. First, you build and test. Then you create a Docker image. Then you hopefully integration test that Docker image by running it and running some tests against it. Then you publish those Docker images that you know work 
to a Docker registry. The solution we came up with is to generate pull requests after that publish to any child image that uses that image that we just published. Once you have a, the pull request generated, the pull request pipeline runs. The pull request pipeline is the same as your normal pipeline, except it ends at integration test. If all is green, then we merge, and we run the regular pipeline to publish this image to a Docker registry. We then generate pull requests to any child images from that image. And this is how we do a cascade of updates until we cover all of the images that we have. While I was at Salesforce, I was fortunate enough to open source a tool called Dockerfile Image Update. It's a command line tool, and it's designed to be invoked as part of your CI, CI CD processes. The main way to invoke the tool is to run the parent subcommand, give it a parent image name, a version, and a persistence repo that's going to maintain the version, the mapping of image name to version. I'll get into why we need that persistence repo in a little bit. Here's an example of what the command looks like without any of the funny brackets. Here we're updating CentOS JDK image to version 10 and persisting that mapping into a repository called image tag store. This is what the image tag store looks like. It's just a simple mapping of image name to our intended image version. The reason we use it is so that we can cover a lot of edge conditions that you face in a day-to-day -day pull request or developer flow. For example, a lazy developer like myself might have an old version of a Docker file checked out that I haven't updated in a while. So it has an old version of a parent base image. I'll copy and paste that into a new project that I'm spinning up and submit that. The all subcommand will go through periodically um, against our intended state and recreate any pull requests to projects that deviate, such as the one that I used in the lazy developer example. There are other edge conditions, such as merge conflicts um, that where developers will accidentally bump something down a version, um, or, or perhaps uh, you know, we, we just have um, some race condition with generating pull requests. If you have a large number of images, it's going to take you a long time to run this all subcommand. What you can do is you can split your image tag store into, into chunks so that you can run the all subcommand more frequently. If you have a critical set of images, you would create a separate image tag store for those and leave the rest running at a slower cadence. This is what one of the pull requests look like. As you can see, pretty simple. We're bumping Alpine Java from version 7 to 11. So now this brings me to a live demo. Let's hope that it'll work. So first step, let's uh, refresh this page, make sure that we, got, we have internet. Looks like we do. All right, so what I have here is a tree of images. We start with the Alpine base image. That's our base OS image. As you can see, it's vulnerable. It's vulnerable to an old version of BusyBox. If you look at any of the child images from this image, for example, Alpine Java, it's also vulnerable, and it's going to be vulnerable to the same exact thing. If we go to the Alpine Python image, 
it's vulnerable as well. And the rest of the images are also going to be vulnerable. So what we'll do is we'll fix this vulnerability. For demo purposes, I depended on an old version of Alpine. So instead, what I'm going, going to do is I'm going to switch this Docker file back to bootstrapping from scratch and applying a root tar that I've generated, which I'll show you in a little bit. We commit these changes. And let's make sure that this job starts running. Give it a second. So it started running. We can see here that we have a test and release pipeline. The first phase is build and test. Then we publish the image that we build. And then lastly, we run Docker file image update. If we look at what this looks like in code, we have the bootstrapping done here. We're creating a ch root, tarring it up, and then building a Docker image from it. We then push to a Docker registry. And the, the last phase is to run Docker file image update. Over here, we give it the GitHub URL. You can use GitHub Enterprise if, if that's what you use. It needs a set of GitHub API credentials. Without those, it wouldn't be able to create pull requests from a specific user. Over here, I'm telling it to run against my own GitHub org. It'd probably be really comical if I were to run this against all of GitHub. We have the image name right after the parent subcommand. I'm na namespacing it under my own namespace on, on the public uh, Docker registry. We use simple integer, integers for versioning. And then the image tag store is invoked here. Let's, let's check to make sure to see if our build has finished. It's almost done. You can see what, what the output looks like. Uh-oh, it failed. That's the great, great part about live demos. So it looks like if we retry this, it'll it should go again. But let's, let's see if uh, any of the pull requests generated anyway. So we did get a pull request to Alpine Python. And we did get a pull request to Alpine Java. So even though it failed, it failed um, and retried um, at the end. So these pull requests are running. You can see that it's that advertised version bump. We'll merge this because it went green. Alpine Python is still running. Let's check on the build. So while that's running, I'll show you what the oh, I will show you what the Jenkins files looks like for Alpine Java. We're doing almost exactly the same thing as we did in the parent image. The only difference is the image name. If you're doing this in a professional environment, I'd recommend using Jenkins file shared libraries. That way you don't copy and paste boiler boilerplate code around. Let's refresh Alpine Python to, it's taking a little longer than usual. Huh, it auto closed. Oh, so what happens is because I re-kicked off the do Docker file image update, when it detects that there's an unmerged pull request, it will recreate the pull request. So that's by design. So we'll, we'll trust this one and merge it so that we can proceed with the demo. 
we did merge Alpine Java. So the Hello World app received the pull request. So now you can see the cascade going forward. Again, the version bump is over here. To speed things up, I think I'm going to merge before these fully go green. Let's take a look at and check the other images. So uh, Python 2 test app has not gotten its pull request yet. Python 3 test app has not gotten its pull request yet either. However, Hello World app finished. So we'll merge that. We'll give the Python images maybe 30 more seconds. You know, the joys of the joys of live demos. Um, so it's going to the publish phase, then it's it's probably gonna take another twenty to thirty seconds. So what I'll show you is what the image tag store looks like. It accumulates all of the images that we have in our environment. If we look at what's going on in the registry, we see that we have now fixed that Alpine image. Um, if we look at the Alpine Java image, which, which successfully proceeded, we have no vulnerabilities there as well. Alpine Python just finished building, so it has no vulnerabilities now as well. Let's check. So we have a pull request to Python 3 test app. We're going to merge that. We're not going to wait for the pull request to finish. Normally, we would. Python 2 test app failed. Now, unlike other parts of this demo, this is actually an intentional failure. If we look at the error that this image has, it's a syntax error. If we look at the code behind Python, Python 2 test app, it's intentionally written in Python 2 syntax. So it's working Python 2 code. If we look at the Python, uh, Alpine Python image, whoops, wrong file. It is, I forced it to be Python 3 only. So the fact that this pull request failed, it shows us, it gives us feedback as a developer that the parent image is not good. There's a change that was made on the parent image that is gonna cause this image to fail so it prevented us from rolling something out that we might have to roll back. In a nutshell, it's important to keep um, it, it's important to, to keep testing in in your security update process. So Python three test app finished, so no vulnerabilities there. Python two test app is never going to finish until we make some code fixes, so that's going to remain vulnerable. So we had a semi-successful live demo. There were some hiccups. But in a nutshell, we made one code change that aside from some CI slowness and the need to retry CI a little bit, we were able to fix all the vulnerabilities in our system except for when it wasn't safe to do so. So there are a number of headwinds that made this demo work. The first is we were building from scratch. If you're in an environment that is supposed to be highly secure, you should avoid pulling artifacts from the internet any time you, you build. Every time you pull artifacts from the internet, an attacker can sniff that traffic and find out or deduce what kind of things you're, you're pulling in and what you depend on. If you pull artifacts once and and maintain them in your own private repositories, in your private package repositories, then you avoid that problem. However, you do have to fund a team that, that manages this for you, so it can get expensive, time consuming, and you have to figure out how to bootstrap your Docker images from scratch. 
ideally, you, we wouldn't re reinvent the wheel and you would depend on a distribution's um, official Docker images. The other thing that we controlled was versioning. By controlling versioning, we're able to generate pull requests. These pull requests make sense to a developer when they see them. There's an actual code change going on, a version bump. Distributions usually publish official Docker images that have descriptive version tags. The image can change out from under you, and you won't know it unless you're checking the, the SHAs in, in Docker Hub or, or in the Docker registries. At Lyft, what we do to avoid some of these problems without having to invest in a team that um, you know, builds our Docker-based Docker images from scratch is we have a concept of intermediate repositories. These repositories will pull from a public vendor and push our own image from there and push it into our private registries. If you're building an application or an intermediate or, or a language image for use by, by applications, you're not allowed to pull or depend on images from the internet. The CI system enforces that. If you have, if you want to create an intermediate repository, you have to go through extra hoops to get privileges. So we have a very limited set of these intermediate repositories that pull from public. One gotcha is that we are forced to run the distribution upgrade command um, after we pull down the public image. It sucks to do that. You're generating an extra layer. You're increasing the size of the images. However, what, we've, what we find is that distributions update their Docker images far less frequently than they update their traditional package repositories. So to, to make sure that we're on top of our security updates, we, do that, we create that extra layer where we run the app get upgrade for Debian-based distributions or yum update for Red Hat-based. In order to go away from the versioning problem that, that I mentioned earlier with distributions, we invoke the intermediate repositories on a schedule. The, we find that that, that that gives us the best balance because when you have other um, images that other child images from that intermediate repository, they might be doing their own apt installs or yum installs. So they might they need to we need to trigger at a time at a schedule a rebuild of all of those layers so that we're always as in sync as we want to be with the upstream traditional package repositories. The other problem that you might face is unmerged pull requests. Developers will go on vacation. Developers might kind of just see these pull requests as a routine thing and, and, and just stop merging them. What we do at Lyft is we merge them after a certain period of time. If they're open for X number of days, we automatically merge these pull requests. One thing that we've considered and that we also do is if the pull requests are read and the image is not in a critical path, if it won't break production, then we force merge these pull requests. It kind of signals to developers that Look, if you don't prioritize these pull requests, you're, you know, we're, we're, you know, security is more important than you shipping features. So that's what we kind of try to try to present. Some of the things that could be improved is, well, first of all, the automation that I showed you only works with Docker files. It would be nice to be able to update Docker files that are declared in, in Maven, for example. Two, we've 
automated updating the Docker images themselves, but what about deploying? deploying things. Why not generate the pull requests for Docker Compose YAMLs and Kubernetes Pod YAMLs? We've made it as far as updating the Docker images. Why not go all the way? It would be great to get pull requests for other packaging type or for other, for other packaging types and other language dependency managers. Maven, for example, it would be nice to get pull requests to your POMs, maybe Gradle. Etc. And finally, right now, the open source project is only supports um, GitHub. It would be nice if it could support Bitbucket and GitLab as well. So one of the great things about DevOps is these theater seats, people fall asleep in them. So if you're just now waking up from your nap, here's the things to take away. First, it's important that you automate routine security patching. If you don't do it, you're likely not going to do it at all. Two, keep your testing cycles with your security update cycles. Anytime you push a security fix and you break things, you have to roll back, and that wastes time. And finally, if you're going to use public images, take extra steps. So if you know of better tools to, or, or ways or strategies of doing things better, please let us know. We're always looking for ways to improve. Otherwise, users of Dockerfile Image Update are more than welcome. At Lyft, we're, we're hiring to solve these problems and many others. So feel free to reach out to me if, if you're interested in, in that or if you're interested in, in discussing how to, how to better solve the, these kinds of problems. Thank you all for, for listening. And I think I have about maybe three minutes for Q&A. So the question is, what were we doing before th this kind of tooling? Uh, well, uh, quite frankly, uh, nothing. We, yeah, if we were just helping, you know, manually clicking through and, and rebuilding images. Oh, over there. Uh, what was the second part of the question? The The question is, what tools were we using to discover vulnerabilities? Uh, in the demo that I showed, um, Google Compute Registry has a free feature. I think it's al it's alpha version that shows you vulnerabilities in your in your Docker images. There are a number of other tools out there. The, but I wasn't able to, or the, they're not as fast as Google Compute Registry's um, vulnerability scanning tool. All the way in the back. Cool. Th yeah. Thanks for thanks for that tip. Uh, what is the what is the tool called again? Cool. Yeah. The the, uh, the gentleman up there s talked about a tool called Anchor. That, pardon me if I paraphrase this paraphrase this wrong, but it runs in your pipelines and it does a vulnerability scan and if it finds vulnerabilities it stops your your builds
Yeah, that sounds seems like a potentially good strategy. We'll have to check it out. All right, time's up. Thank you all for listening. Thank you very much.